Aloha and good morning, everyone. I would like to call the Committee on Zoning and Hi Housing special meeting to order. Uh, I do want to thank Councilmember Kobayashi and Manahan for joining us today, and others will soon be following. Before we start the meeting, I have some procedural announcements. Persons wishing to present oral testimony, if you have not already submitted your registration form to my committee aid, please do so now. Otherwise, please raise your hand to indicate your desire to speak at the time I call for additional speakers. Speakers will be limited to a one-minute presentation on all items. For your information, we'll be taking public testimony after the completion of today's briefing and panel discussion. Uh, written testimonies, including the testifier's address, email address, and phone number, may be posted by the, cit the city clerk and available to the public on the city's DocuShare website. And of course, as a courtesy to others, please turn off all cell phones or place it on silent mo mode during the committee meeting. And of course, members, we are here to discuss the mayor's proposed um, island-wide uh, affordable housing requirement. And uh, before we get there, members, I thought we would just kind of recap of where exactly we are in terms of our housing supply as well as the market um, that's out there right now and what's happening on Oahu and Hawaii. And so we have asked Professor Sumner LaRouche, uh, La LaCroix. LaCroix. I'm so okay. sorry. You know, as Filipinos, sometimes we cannot do really elaborate names like that, but we can do really long Filipino names, you know. <laughs> uh, he is from the UH Economic Resource Organization, and he's going to kind of take a, a long run look at residential housing prices in Honolulu from about 1960 to now. So thank you so much for joining us, Professor. We're so honored that you took the time to be with us today. Happy to be here. No, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Uh, this is a presentation I've given to, uh, to numerous organizations in Honolulu, including realtors. Uh, I gave it at the mayor's uh, uh, housing summit a couple years ago. So it's mm -hmm. updated. It's updated for current data. Um, I'm really trying to look a lot to take a long run look at residential housing prices in, in Honolulu uh, over about a 60 year period. And um, uh, <laughs> let's just take a quick snapshot of, of prices currently. So if we're talking about single family homes, I'm going to confine my discussion to single family homes just on the basis of time to keep the presentation short. But Honolulu had higher residential prices in all but three U.S. metropolitan areas in uh, 2016. <laughs> so you know, San Jose has now reached the point where the median home is a million bucks. Mm -hmm. um, that's amazing. Uh, you have San Francisco just below it at about 840. Uh, you got Anaheim, Santa Ana, another 100,000 <laughs> below that at uh, 740. Then we're right there at 730. Uh, mm -hmm. If we update this, these are fourth quarter 2016 to uh, March 2017. Honolulu is up to, to uh, 752. Uh, we're basically tied there with the with the Anaheim area in, um, in, in Los Angeles. Uh, it's really notable, I think, that, that those four cities, Honolulu, Anaheim, Santa Ana, uh, San Francisco, and San Jose, are national outliers. That to get down to the next city, San Diego, you have to drop $170,000 in median prices. You know, there's a bunch of cities near, near San Diego, including places like Seattle, Boston. Um, you just get down the list from there. But these four are really outliers. We're, 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 um, we're notably higher than, than about anywhere else in the country. Um, this is not a new phenomenon. Sometimes I talk to people and they're like, oh, there's a recent run up in housing prices. But if you go back to 1960 and 1980, you also find that housing prices in Hawaii, and I'm presenting Hawaii prices, not Honolulu prices, because I have better data for this, but that housing prices in Hawaii were much higher than on the mainland even back in 1960. So if you look at 1960 prices, we were at $103,000 for the median price. Um, mainland, uh, $59,000, a significant premium, not quite two to one. By 1980, it was now more than two to one. Hawaii prices had gone to about 234,000. Mainland prices had increased to 93,000, but the gap was increasing between, um, between Hawaii prices and mainland prices. So this is a, this is a long standing phenomenon. It's nothing new. Um, if we look, if we adjust for inflation, if we adjust for inflation, it makes a huge difference in how we view the housing market. Uh, inflation adjusted Honolulu uh, single family housing prices have increased about 50% since 1980. Actually, that's for 2014. Uh, there's been significant appreciation the last couple of years, so we're more up to about 65% if we're going to uh, update that to today. Uh, but the 2014 inflation-adjusted price of housing was about the same as the 1990 inflation-adjusted price of housing. You know, we don't really like to look at it that way because we all bear the high cost of housing. But, but 
but the real price of housing, adjusted for inflation, hasn't increased a lot since 1990. Here's a graph kind of showing that. So the upper line there is the nominal housing price. That's the actual, actual price of housing. So I've scaled it to 100 so you can look at it in percentage terms. So you can see that from, uh, from 1980 up to 2016, uh, the price of housing has increased by about a factor of five. It's gone from 100 to over 500. Okay. But, but the real price of housing has gone up less. Uh, the real price of housing has, only, has gone up by about 66%. Okay. Still, that's a lot. Housing was already really expensive in 1980. And to have a 66% increase um, has, made it, has made it much less affordable. Note, however, there's a lot of variation along the way. So if we're comparing, say, 1980 with the year uh, 2002, housing prices didn't increase at all. But there's been a big run-up in the 2000s and the decade of the 2010s, okay, uh, with a small, small decrease during the Great Recession period. But then we've pretty much recovered in real terms uh, back to where we were in 2005. Um, so yes, there's been, significant, there's been significant increases in real housing prices, but the prices have been more volatile than people like to think. Housing is not exactly a sure investment in Hawaii unless you're a long-term holder. Um, well, you know, economists, we're called a dismal science sometimes. There's reasons for that. <laughs> That's because we have these unfortunate truths sometimes to, to, to tell people. And one unfortunate truth is this. If you live in a really nice place in the United States, and Honolulu has all sorts of positive, nice things about it, okay? climate, low pollution levels, warm ocean waters, multicultural and multi-ethnic uh, environment highlighted by the host Hawaiian culture, na uh, natural beauty, low crime rates. These drive up Honolulu housing prices. Sometimes living here, we tend to fixate on, on, on negative attributes like traffic congestion okay, or, or, or the VOG, things along those lines. We get wrapped up in that. We forget that uh, it's a really nice place to live and that when people come to Honolulu, they see it's a really nice place to live. That drives up prices. That increases demand. It's also business attributes. Those are a bit more muted. Good business attributes also drive up prices in the city. Uh, population size, we're only a moderate population center. Access to national and international markets, mm, it's kind of a moderate factor. Supply of intermediate goods and finance, mm, it's kind of poor almost. Skilled labor pool is pretty good. We have, a, we have a relatively skilled pool of labor here. So those things slightly push up housing prices, but it's, it's, on, the, it's on the residential side, the residential attributes there. They're really good, and, and if you have good attributes, you have to pay for it one of two ways. Either you have to accept lower wages or pay higher housing prices, or even worse, both. Our wages aren't that far below national levels. We're, we're, a lot of areas we're, we're close to the average. Uh, we're slightly below, slightly below national levels in other fields, um, but housing prices are much, much higher. And we're paying for that partly because of, um, of the good attributes. And in some ways, in some ways, that is something that's not going to go away. Housing prices are always going to be higher than elsewhere. The question is how much higher, okay? I mean, how much higher are they going to be? Uh, there's always going to be a premium to be paid. <laughs> Uh, why are housing prices going higher in the 2000s, 2010s? Part of it's an expansion of traded goods sectors. Traded goods sectors tend to lead to uh, housing price increases. Uh, the two big traded goods sectors that have increased in the decade of the 2000s and 2010s are tourism and the military in Honolulu. Uh, this increases the income of skilled workers. They bid up the price of housing. But, but how, much does how, how much does the price of housing goes up? This depends on what economists would call the elasticity of supply for housing. So I have a little graph here. If you're in the first graph and housing demand goes up, then basically there's lots of building. Okay? If you're in like St. Louis and housing demand goes up, uh, people start redeveloping farmland. It's easy to redevelop farmland in St. Louis, more housing is built. We find the price of housing doesn't change. On the other hand, there's all sorts of cities where there's not that much developable land. Uh, there are restrictions on the development and the supply is, 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 is much more uh, straight up and down. So then increases in demand just get reflected in increases in prices. That second graph is more like Honolulu. So three factors determining housing supply elasticity here. One's just the natural supply of land, okay? Um, okay, it's almost trivial I put up a map of us as an island. We all know that, but, but you know, when, when you start looking at it, they're really, it's, it's, it's one of those where a lot of cities have uh, land 30 miles away. We have ocean, but we also have the Kulaus, and we have the Waianae Range, and we've got water areas like Pearl Harbor. There's also some extensive wetlands. Once you take that out, you compare it nationally, we lead the country in the percent of land that's basically undevelopable. Okay. Um, part of that is we have a lot of ocean in those, in those circles there. There's, there's the mountains, um, wetlands, all the things I talked about there. You have to go down to Ventura, California at 80%. Ventura, you have the ocean on one side and you have the mountains on the other. Uh, they really struggle too with developments <laughs> all just stuck into a little, ba in, into a little band of land uh, uh, there. Okay. Severity of land development regulations. How does Honolulu rank in this regard compared to other cities? Um, I'm looking at the Wharton Residential Land Use Regulation Index. I do want to note, too, that this kind of combines regulation by the state and by the city. 
So we look at this, it's not like the city is a regulatory hell for housing development. I mean, um, the state also imposes significant restrictions on greenfield development of housing. And uh, when we look at the Honolulu score in this index, um, it's, 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 it's the highest in the country. Uh, again, that includes not just city and county regulation, but also state regulation. Uh, I found some mistakes in the score. When I correct them, it's, it's, it's an even higher score. Um, I wouldn't pay too much attention to the actual numbers itself, but I mean, one of the things which I've emphasized in my research in housing on Hawaii is that we've got, we, have, we have multiple layers of review. And the more layers of review that you have, projects can fail if you miss just one layer of review. We have a lot of layers of review. Um, I'm not going to go over it just in the purposes of time here, but you can just see on the slide the numerous things that a project sometimes has to meet. Now, this is more of a greenfield project. Um, projects that are projects that are not greenfield projects, pr projects where there's, there's redevelopment or land is already zoned uh, for urban use, um, you don't have to meet as many of these multiple layers, and then it's easier it's easier to build housing. Um, so the third effect too, which I think is becoming increasingly uh, noticeable in Honolulu, and was not was less here. 20, 25 years ago, and that's what's called the home voter effect. Okay, so if you're in a city and housing prices have increased, uh, say there's been a movement of, of firms that are producing tradable goods to your city, Seattle. So Seattle, uh, when I lived there, Seattle just had Boeing. Now it's got Boeing and Microsoft and Amazon. So there are all these skilled workers there who are bidding up the housing prices, okay? Um, once the city's prices become very high, then homeowners have stronger incentives to lobby and vote for more severe regulation on home building to stop development in their neighborhood to ensure the price of their homes remain high. Certainly there's all sorts of examples of that in Honolulu and it's always hard to sort out these examples. Sometimes people lobby against development in their neighborhood just because they believe the development's misconceived. It's going to have lots of negative effect on neighbors. Once we take that into account, it's not a good development. Other times people really just don't want to see any development that would lower the price of their homes. So any development that might say block your view regardless if several thousand units are going in or whatever, that's not good development from your point of view. And understandably, because that's people's major asset, their homes <coughs> in Hawaii. So, so people are, because the assets become so high priced, uh, what we're finding is there's a, lot more, there's a lot more voter activity, a lot more voter and homeowner activity uh, trying basically to say, do development, but don't do it in my neighborhood. Once you get that everywhere, you get less development. Um, uh, Honolulu, the highest construction costs um, in the country among major cities. I pulled this out of one of the Uhiro construction reports recently. Um, we're up there with New York. New York's a very difficult place to build because of the density of, uh, of uh, a development in New York. We're also a very dense city uh, in the center part of the city, so it's not surprising that we're up there. Um, construction materials are mostly imported. We face burdens because of the Jones Act. Um, doing something to not repeal the Jones Act, but to liberalize it a little bit, uh, say to be able to use foreign ships, to be able to use foreign ships even while keeping the um, requirement f for U.S. labor, that could do a lot to reduce the cost of, uh, of uh, building materials in Hawaii. And that could, because construction costs are so high, building materials are now a big part of the cost of building, of building new developments. Uh, this was less so five years ago. Now you all know this because we have the train too that's facing problems with, uh, with, uh, high, with uh, high construction costs. The last four years, last five years in Honolulu, have all seen double-digit increases in construction costs. So if I was giving this presentation five years ago, I wouldn't have this graph up here. Construction costs are much lower. Now it's much higher, and construction costs are a much bigger part of the cost of a development, where five years ago, land was a, was a, was a much more significant cost. Um, well, we've, we've had fewer residential units authorized in h &L. Um, There's some cycles to this. There's some cycles to this. We've just come out of a major recession. Uh, nationally, housing development is behind. Um, it's just back up to the levels it was at in 2005, but there's big deficits nationally and in Honolulu as to, um, as to building new housing. Um, it may well be that those deficits will be made up over the next few years because housing is a um, construction is a relatively cyclical industry. But I do want to note that when I look at the You Hero report on construction, uh, which I don't have much to do with, but I think is the leading, uh, is the leading research uh, um, output on construction activity in the state, uh, they're predicting a decline in construction over the next uh, over the next three or four years. They think the cycle is peaking and we'll probably see it peak next year and then we'll see a decline in construction activity. Um, if, if the decline in construction activity includes residential housing, we'll be left with a housing deficit. If we don't build, the supply is lower. The supply is lower, prices are going to be higher. Um, there's always a question of how much you want to build, but we're, we're building a lot less than we ever used to. It's, it's, uh, it's, you can see the increase in the condo activity, the condo's the lower line, you can see some of the increases in condo activity. So we all see that, but there's just not that much activity in single family housing. It fell off dramatically and it really 
really hasn't come back. It's difficult to get zoning for single family housing as, <laughs> um, as we see with Coe Ridge and with Mopili, um, um, in w which require the state, which require basically um, a new designation, moving land from agricultural land out to, the, out to urban land. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you so Happy much, Professor. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, members, are, does anyone have any questions at this time? Um, I have a question. I just want to make sure that we're talking the same language. So in layman's turn, on your scale, the nominal and inflation-adjusted right. um, SFH prices for Honolulu, you, you talk about real median as well as median scale. So can you, in layman's term, explain that? Okay, so what I did was I just I just started everything off at 100. That's not the actual price of housing in 1980, mm -hmm. but I did it at 100. So then if you if it moves to 200, that would mean that prices have doubled. The 300 prices have tripled. So the scale helps you put this all in, in percentage terms. And so again, if we just look at the actual price of housing, you can see that during the 1980s, there was a big run up. Okay, that's, that's partly the Japanese, that's the period where we had uh, tremendous Japanese travel here and Japanese foreign investment. Mm -hmm. Uh, the economy was doing really well. Uh, people buying homes bid up the price of, uh, of housing. And then in the 1990s, the price of, ha of housing actually falls. And inflation continues in the 1990s. So in the inflation adjusted graph, it's a big, it's actually a big fall. Uh, it's a much bigger fall in the price of housing. And then there's the massive run up over that period, uh, 2001 to about 2006, mm -hmm. where we have a dramatic increase in the price of housing. It, 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 it more than doubles, it goes from 200 to 400. So it more than doubles over that period. And then. There's the recent fall-offs the, uh, of the Great Recession of the 2007-2009 led to housing decreases here and it plateaued out at about 2011. And since 2011, um, prices have been going back on up. Um, so now if we just take out the effect of inflation, there's been a lot of inflation over that period, just rises in the general price level. Um, it's not quite as big of an effect. But still, I do want to note that, you know, if we're talking about over 37 years, the price of housing increasing by 66%. That's the median home. 50% of the homes are priced less, 50% of the homes are priced more. The average wage earner in Hawaii has not had much of a wage increase over that period. Median wages in Hawaii are, are, are only slightly higher than they were in 1980. So somebody who's, the, who's in the median household mm -hmm. is, finding that, is finding that their wages haven't increased much, but the, but, the cost of, but the cost of housing has increased about 66%. I'm focusing on prices here too, not on rents. Rent changes have been have been somewhat, have been a little bit different, but not that different. Yeah. When you refer to the median um, household income, what what price range are you talking about? For median household incomes. Yes. Um, uh, for median household incomes, we're, t we're we're talking in the in the in the in the high fifties for a household in Hawaii. Um, okay. Together um, or individual. That's each, together. Each making oh, so, oh. so for a, a full household, we're talking about an income of about about fifty four. About well, it depends what year we look at, but but mm -hmm. but the latest data that we have around two thousand fifteen okay. um, shows it in the high fifties. If we're looking at a family, it's a little bit higher. Households tend to sometimes have um, more members in, than just the family, than just the immediate nuclear family in them. Um, but but it's relatively it's relatively low and it has not changed a lot. It hasn't changed a lot on the wage side um, since since the eighties. But this, this, this falls a national trend, too. The, the wages have been relatively flat at the, at the median level. For people who are in the upper 15 percent, um, skilled professionals and the relatively rich, um, they've had big income gains. Okay. And it's that's bid up. That's one of the reasons why the price of housing has been bid up at, at upper levels. Once you start to bid up the price of housing at upper levels, though, the price increases filter down mm -hmm. to lower levels also. I mean, the housing markets are linked. Well, thank you so much, Professor. Any other questions? Are you going to stick around? Or? I'll stick around. Okay, I think th they might have some more questions okay. following. Thank you so much. We have a lot of people that would like to um, be part of this discussion today, but first we are going to next hear from um, the mayor's representative, Harrison Rue, um, Transient Oriented Development Administrator. Uh, Councilmember Blant, let me just uh, switch the PowerPoint just okay. one second. Thank you so much for the record, Harrison Ruth, TOD Administrator. And uh, I'm, I'm here today uh, as, as uh, a coordinator of a very large group of city staff from five different departments who've developed this uh, ordinance. And 
We want to give uh, thank you so much for the request to kind of get it in front of council and the public. We're still working on final uh, legal review of the elements, but it'll be coming to you shortly. Um, I, th I think we'd like to see today as a you know, courtesy pre-briefing so that you know what's in it, you know, before you get get it uh, in the next week or two. Um, what we're going to talk about is just quickly the overall housing strategy because it's not just the requirement; it really fits into a uh, a nested strategy, give you a quick uh, update on priorities, just a few minutes, and then walk through the ordinance itself, the research and anal analysis, the stakeholder <coughs> input we got, the percentages and details, uh, how the 30-year period uh, works. Um, what will be new news is really the, the part we've been working on for the last few months is a scheduled phase in by area and over time. So that's what's been taking us the last few months to get the details of that working right. Um, some questions about how in lieu fees produce housing. There's been a lot of questions about that. And then a little bit about administration and monitoring. So, um, and then uh, just mention the financial incentives ordinance that's, you know, paralleling this. Uh, I think you're all familiar with the housing strategy. Mayor introduced a few years ago, five major elements, um, 20 strategies across that. Um, we've actually been implementing and working away on majority of those actions, made significant progress. That responds to four uh, different uh, council initiatives and resolutions to de develop a policy for TOD, to amend the unilateral agreement policy, to establish affordable housing strategy, and then to regulate accessory dwelling units. Uh, we want to thank council for your leadership in that as well. I mentioned the staff team. Um, it, we started uh, really about three and a half years ago with uh, weekly and bi-weekly meetings for a couple hours uh, at, at department director and deputy level, as well as some of the key staff that have been working in divisions for 30 years. So it's a, a combination of city's best and brightest and those who know how things really work. And, and there was a, a lot of discussions to come up with that. What Mayor asked for is a strategic action plan that would really be a list of doable actions that we can accomplish. It's based on decades of, you know, task forces and working groups, and we looked at those and thought, why aren't some of these things happening? So the goal was to figure out how to actually make some of this happen. Uh, the vision is, is pretty simple. Housing choices that build communities, strengthen neighborhoods, and fit family budgets. Um, all people will have access to shelter. The vision doesn't guarantee shelter to everybody, but, you know, access to, to everybody. And it's based on the TOD and transit ready development, compact mixed use design, and healthy age friendly communities principles. So it's more than housing. I think you're all familiar with the numbers um, in terms of latent demand by income group, but just, you know, to point out, um, you know, Professor LaCroix was focusing on single family housing and the pricing of that. Part of our job in the public sector is to also um, make, provide access and, and solve problems for people who are at the lower and middle ends. I think roughly half of city employees ourselves, you know, are in the 60% AMI uh, range. So, you know, this is uh, folks that work with and for us. Um, the strategy, just to give the quick update, um, Mayor went over some of these in his State of the City approach, but uh, State of the City address. Um, that bottom group is things that are moving along really well. Lots more work to do, but uh, you know, you pass the accessory dwelling units, the incentives, we're seeing great progress on that. Um, you're seeing uh, Housing First and Shelter initiatives. There's plenty more to do there, but the Council has been funding a lot of that work, and, and you're very familiar with that. You're familiar with the TOD zoning and infrastructure investments. There's a lot going on there. We're not going to talk uh, really much about those today. Um, two of the, the new uh, things that, that Mayor announced was the idea of uh, putting out more city lands. We've identified nine properties, and they're in process of working through how to um, RFP those to private developers. You will be in the loop and approving all of that, but we want to really use the city lands to make housing happen. Um, and then the rental housing finance approach to use the private activity bonds. This is an idea that came out of our work with the developer groups in developing this ordinance. Uh, a couple of developers are really pushing for that, so we're responding. We're going to make that happen. What we're really here to talk about today is the, the top two, really the affordable housing requirement and the new news of how we're proposing to phase it in, and then the financial incentives that go along along with that ordinance. Um, you're familiar, you know, again, you know, lots of 
focus on TOD, on infrastructure investments, getting inf you know infrastructure in place uh, to make ha affordable housing happen, like Mayor Wright. Um, I want to switch over to the background research. Um, we started out doing some of this research ourselves uh, and looking at municipalities across the country. So three years ago, you know, we found that um, almost all the ones that we looked at, I think we looked at about 18 of the 500 that seemed similar. Um, compared to existing UA at the time, uh, almost all those programs had a much longer affordability period, lower AM AMI ranges than, than we do, uh, but they also had a lower percentage of units required, so lower than the 30 percent. Um, and they, most of them applied it to all building permits, not just rezoning like our UA. So we started out thinking, let's, let's craft a draft uh, uh, approach that you know, fits with what other cities are doing. We talked with staff and experts from other cities, both on the phone and meeting them at conferences and things like that. So we then, once we had, uh, if you remember back, we floated the, in the draft strategy, we floated that concept lower, longer, uh, lower AMI, and then we um, hired consultants to actually plug that into feasibility models to test them. Um, we also uh, looked at best practices uh, from studies that other folks have done nationally. There's been a lot of study of this recently. Um, economics of inclusionary development by ULI, uh, inclusionary housing by Mr. Hickey, who um, was also here and met with you and met with us as well. Um, inclusionary housing by Rick Jacobus. We ended up um, hiring uh, Mr. Jacobus to do a policy memo as well, so you'll see that coming up a little later. Um, a thing from Lisa Sturdivant, which is really good fact from fiction. And then uh, uh, another one by Mr. Jacobus, delivering on the promise of inclusionary housing. It's a little dated from 2009, but it really explores how best to uh, ad administer and monitor and what the staffing levels are required. We'll talk a little more about that at the end. Then we sponsored uh, two studies sequentially. First, the residential nexus analysis. We hired, you know, mainland consultants who are experienced in this, but we grounded their work with, you know, local advice and had them tailor it specifically for Honolulu. Um, the residential nexus analysis, and then we had our um, economics consultant who was already on board for the TOD finance work and added to their task to do the financial analysis. And then once we were almost done last fall, we asked Mr. Jacobus to do a small task of reviewing our proposal he spent a couple of days in town meeting with all the stakeholders, uh, advocates, developers, state partners, and worked through how to how to best refine it uh, for for rollout geographically. So we'll talk about that near the end. I'm going to just a little bit, a very little bit. These are all thick studies. Uh, we're making these all available to you. Some of your staff have seen a few of them already. Um, the Kaiser Marston Residential Nexus Analysis analyzed the impact that new residential development has on affordable housing. Um, this doesn't determine what you should charge, but it kind of backs up that policy decision. So it looked at making sure that the percentages proposed were proportionate to the impacts caused by housing and sufficient to mitigate those impacts. So this, they looked at uh, inclusionary percentages across five building types. And the, it basically ranged from 17.3 to 21.7 percent. So this fit already with what we looked at. Other places are, are, are charging. We asked them to test our, our 20 percent model. Um, and then they calculated the affordability gaps, the subsidy that would be needed per affordable unit to produce those. <clears throat> and that's partly how we came up with the proposed in lieu fee that's coming up. The affordability gaps, uh, any of the affordable housing providers, this is not news to you guys who work with us all the time, but you know the two that would m be most affected by this policy, it costs or takes around $70,000 uh, in subsidy to make a 80 to 120 unit affordable. It takes 170,000 if you're trying to subsidize uh, something below 80. And you can see down on the bottom, you know, $367,000 if you're trying to subsidize a, a for sale unit for somebody in the, you know, in the 30% AMI, which is why you don't see a lot of that. You pretty much have to pay the cost. Since most renters and buyers can pay part or most of the cost, the subsidy only needs to cover the difference between what they earn and can pay and what the 
cost of construction is. That's the affordability gap. So when we talk about using an in lieu fee to to cover the affordability gap, it's not like you're trying to use that to pay for a $400,000 condo. It's just for the gap between what somebody can afford and what it costs. So uh, we had them look at the cost per square foot of creating those new affordable units. That didn't decide what the fee should be, but it provides technical analysis to support the policy decision of what the in lieu fee is. Ultimately, that policy decision will come to you in the report, and we encourage you to you know, have more conversation. We are, we looked at the five different types. They range from 3170 to 5770, and the middle ones are in the 40, 44, 48 range. So we literally picked the middle of the middle and are proposing the $45 fee. That was tested later, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But that's the, the underpinnings of the recommendation. And I also have a little more about how that works on a real project in, in producing units a little bit later in the presentation. Um, we then ask strategic economics. They were already under contract, so we um, added another task. And they did the pro forma analysis to test the actual impact of the proposed requirement on development feasibility. We didn't want to have numbers that did, you know, what, what Maui did a few years ago, they had a way too high a percentage and it just shut down development. Nobody was developing because it was just too high. But we didn't want to just read the mainland reports. We wanted to look at local numbers. Um, they analyzed the bonus density, the community benefits, the financial incentives, fee waivers, less parking. Uh, these performers and the numbers are all in the report you'll see. They tested the feasibility of several building prototypes in different locations around Oahu. And we had several rounds of interviews, um, focus groups with local developers, industry reps. They also met with state agencies and anybody willing to meet. Um, we actually authorized uh, many of the developers to talk to them directly and share their project information directly with them um, so that it wasn't filtered through the city. Some of that's proprietary information. Um, this is just a quick glimpse, glimpse of uh, the four different types, you know, low rise, uh, low rise apartments, mid rise, and high rise. They did pro formas for all those. Um, they looked at the revenue, the cost, and return assumptions. They were developed through national and local market research, developer inputs, uh, in interviews, and city staff input. It assumed purchase of land at market rates. So, you know, that's one of the things that makes it infeasible if you have to go out and buy the land now. So, people say, well, you know, this shows that a lot of development isn't feasible. Well, some developers have land that they, you know, so they're able to make things work because they're kind of discounting their land to get a project going. Um, what the project um, showed is that, um, you know, it was a little, frankly, depressing to see what we probably didn't need a study to say. It's darn hard to build in Honolulu, and the numbers don't pencil for a lot of projects in a lot of locations. So. It showed what we sort of knew already from developers coming in and proposing projects. Ala Moana area is a hot market. The high-rise condos there are feasible with the higher density that we provided under the interim plan development permit. The returns are, are good. Even when you include the affordable housing requirement, the 25% return without it drops to 19%. So that's profitable. That's why we're seeing all these applications in that area right now. Um, the next one um, that's closest to feasibility are low-rise condos in Pearl Ridge, but even those are only 10% returns. It's profitable, but probably not enough to proceed. So this is one of the reasons why we'll talk a little later about how we're, why we're proposing to phase it in over time and focus on the hot markets initially. So m most of the other prototypes we tested are not yet feasible due to high construction and land costs. Um, some projects are getting built with reduced cost or free land, some other subsidies or other incentives. Um, the affordable housing requirement itself is, compared to land cost and construction costs, it's a relatively modest burden as a percentage of the total development. So uh, Strategic Economics made the initial recommendation to phase in the hot market areas first and then add areas at reduced uh, percentages. The expe expectation in the industry, though, is that as the initial TUD projects are built, um, new market uh, comps will help other projects uh, pencil out. Uh, 
I noticed that the developer of Kapolei Law Office in here, he shared with us the, the number of banks that he had to go to to get financing for projects. And one of the big st stumbling blocks is we haven't built enough rentals. There were not enough comps to actually make that project work. So as we see TOD happen, um, then that'll make more projects pencil out. We then um, worked some for a while on figuring out what the strategy ought to be to phase it in and realized we needed a little more help. So we engaged Rick Jacobus. Um, he's done some of the seminal studies. He's worked with at least six other major metros to develop and implement um, these kind of requirements. But he's also done lots of research studies across the country. We asked him for, for advice on two issues. Given those uneven market conditions, um, what have other localities done to do this? Should the requirements be different percentages or phased in over time geographically? And second, he's also an expert in how to administer these uh, projects to make it easier for developers. They're uh, concerned about how, how do we do this 30-year affordability period proposing. So we've asked him for advice um, on, on that administration monitoring to make it easy for everybody, to make it easier for homeowner to resell 15 years down the road. Um, so he updated his research on other programs. He knew who to talk to and came back and showed us uh, seven approaches that have been used. They're not theoretical. They're being used by other cities around the country. I'll talk about the admin and monitoring at the end. So uh, he did kind of quick studies, uh, updated his research on seven approaches and, and met with us. He was here for two or three days and met with us and developers and advocates and our state agency partners. Um, looked at cities that have targeted only the high growth areas, ones that vary the requirements by zone. You can kind of see with the bolding where we're leading with this, right? But um, uh, ones that did project by project underwriting. So that's really labor intensive to look at each project individually. Ones that vary the requirements by rents and prices. Ones that allow hardship waivers and appeals. So you've got a unilateral, universal requirement and just give lots of people waivers. Ones that vary requirements by project size. And the last one, the scheduled phase in of requirements. Um, after meeting with us for a few days, uh, he went back and reflected and recommended the combination of number two and number seven, varying by zone and phasing it over time. And that's what we're presenting to you here today. And the details of all those other ones are, are in his report in PowerPoint. So getting to what we're proposing, <coughs> um, requiring a percentage of all new development of 10 units and up to be affordable by people with low to moderate incomes. There's nothing magic about the 10 units. We selected that because that's the current threshold for UA, but it's really up to U U UA uh, agreements for rezoning start at a 10 unit threshold. Um, it requires a smaller percentage of units uh, across more projects, lower income range, ranges, and maintains affordability for longer periods. This is all compared to the existing UA approach. We're proposing to phase it in over three years by location. We'll get to the details in a minute. Uh, the numbers vary by whether it's for sale, for rent, or on or off site. Um, we're strongly recommending a minimum 30-year period of affordability. This is how we build the supply over time and keep it affordable. You can just picture the diagram it would take. We'd, we'd have a, if we stacked Kleenex boxes, we needed you know another floor to, to see the supply build. Um, and then we we really tried to make it um, as as much flexibility for developers with three compliance options. Uh, we had a lot of meetings with the developers. The mayor met personally with a lot of them. We had lots of groups. Uh, a lot of them gave us written input. Um, we did not take um, anywhere near everything that they wanted. You know, most of them wanted don't don't pass the requirement. You know, so you know we were kind of rejecting that advice. But they had lots of really good uh, ways that we should tweak it, and we tried to build as much flexibility. And I would. I would not call this developer friendly, it's developer usable. Um, so there's three, and apologies, this is where it really gets into the geeky details. These numbers are in the handout in, in front of you, the table you know, at the bottom, but I think it's best to look at the screen. Um, construction on site, that's the preferred, strongly preferred, it's underlined. Um, 
strongly prefer to do it on site on the same lot or in the same building as, as principal project. If you're developing a block, you know, the affordable could be in one of the buildings on the block. Um, construction off site, um, that's still encouraged. Lots of developers would rather do that. They can either build it themselves, they can rehab an existing building as long as it's a substantial rehab. We have a different formula for that. Um, it requires essentially uh, roughly 25% more units if you're building off-site. Um, that's only if for sale. We're proposing to keep the rental requirement the same because it's hard to build rental and we think if you're building a for sale development, we'd like to encourage that developer to, if they're doing off-site, to make it rental. Um, then the in-lieu fee or land dedication, we're going to spend a bunch of time talking about how this works later. Um, so that would be a cash contribution paid to the city. Um, we're proposing that $45 for finished square foot, um, proposing that it be annually increased by the CPI. Um, we are recommending that smaller projects under 25 units can get approved for cause uh, by the director, but that anything 25 units or more requires council approval to use the in-lieu fee. Um, the other option related to in-lieu fee is dedication of land improved land with infrastructure to be used to construct affordable housing. It could be provided to a land trust or nonprofit with city approval and oversight. So it doesn't have to go through the city. A developer can do a deal and not have us have to put the land out for RFP. We want housing built. So developer could work out a deal with a local nonprofit or a land trust to provide the land for affordable housing. It just has to be, its um, appraised value has to be uh, equal to the in-lieu fee. Um, I want to reiterate again, the percentages are set to encourage both rentals and on-site construction. That's why we have differences in the percentages. <coughs> so the three-year phase-in, um, we're proposing to phase it in per housing market variations. We spent a bunch of time talking with Mr. Jacobus, you know, after his visit, kicking around what other cities have done on this. And uh, uh, we want to make it as simple as possible. When you read his report, he actually recommended a five-year phase-in with it kind of incrementally going up uh, five percent per year to get up to twenty percent. Um, and everybody that we showed that to is scratching their head. It was just a little too complex. So we have simplified it to a three-year phase-in. Um, effective immediately, only the Alamana downtown and Chinatown rail station areas would be you know, would be on immediately on adoption. Since we're seeing interim plan development permit applications there, and we've, we're talking with at least three to five other developers that are, you know, proposing uh, projects, you know, sometime soon, we know those numbers do work in that area. Um, the second year, so this is the beginning of the second year, after one year, we're proposing that the rest of the island, including the other rail transit station areas to begin with, would be subject to the requirement, although at lower percentages, roughly half. We'll get to the percentages in a minute. And then the fourth year, after a full three years, the beginning of the fourth year, all the other rail, tra rail transit station areas would become one category. So it'd be the same full 20% variation as in the other TOD areas. So getting to the percentages. So the first year, TOD areas, Al Alamana, downtown, Chinatown station areas, we're proposing for construction on site, if it's for sale, 20% of the units and half of those at up to 100% AMI, the other half at up to 120% AMI. If rental, 15% of the units at up to 80% AMI. Construction off site, um, we're proposing uh, that that be required to be in the same rail station area. I think that's one of the issues that we really want to defer to council to talk about and think about. Mm -hmm. Uh, some people have said same rail station area. Some people have said within the same planning area, which sometimes can be two or three stations. Um, and some have said, no, we could get more housing if you were building in uh, uh, Ala Moana and you could, you know, provide more housing in, in Kali. We think that that's really a council needs to think that through. We have advice and opinions and research on that, but let's kind of defer that for now. Um, if offsite, uh, Rental, as we recommended, to incentivize rental would stay the same, but the uh, for sale would jump from 20 to 25%. So we get 25% more affordable housing, 20 to 20, 
20 jumps to 25 is a quarter more, um, and at the same 100 and 120. Uh, the in-lieu fee or land dedication would uh, stay the same recommended $45 per square foot. Um, the beginning of the second year, we're proposing to introduce the island-wide requirement, and that would also apply to every other rail station area, you know, from Kalihi on to uh, Waipahu. Um, we're proposing to reduce the rental to 5%. It's, you know, it's an additional incentive for, for rental to reduce the uh, for sale from 20% to 10%. And the same 100 and one half at 100, half at 120. Um, and then for construction off site, keep that the rental the same again because we're trying to incentivize rental and have the uh, for sale off site jump from 10% to 15% of the units. Um, for the in lieu fee, uh, we looked at whether or not it should be the same, whether it should just be cut in half like the others, and we, uh, we think that calibrating it like essentially the difference between the 10 and 15 um, proposing $27 per finished square foot that's 60 percent of the $45 fee again we want to incentivize people building it that seemed to be the uh, uh, appropriate amount we can talk more about about that um, and then the fourth year this is after three years so there's a two-year gap between the when the island-wide one starts and then uh, you know, the end of the third year, the beginning of the fourth year, the full TOD requirement would be applied to the rest of the rail station areas. The island-wide stays at the same lower requirements. Um, I think this is pretty straightforward. And then the in-lieu fee is $45 in the TOD areas and uh, 27 elsewhere. In terms of what it applies to, any project constructing 10 or more residential units or a subdivision of 10 or more lots. Um, it does apply to substantial rehab. There's a lot of uh, walk-up apartments, two and three and four story buildings that are, uh, could get uh, renovated and provide substantial uh, well-built affordable housing if they're rehabbed. We want to encourage that. Um, it would exempt uh, commercial development, hotels, except the ones that are really dwelling units and we can talk more about that the difference in that uh, exempts all the previously entitled projects and subdivisions that have been uh, granted uh, in ua so you know places like Hoopili or uh or ridge or you know milani and eva those are all um exempted anything subject to an existing unilateral agreement um, anything that's already affordable by design, so Ohana units, ADUs, micro units, 201H projects, any tax register projects, this, they automatically get exempted and, you know, since already providing affordable housing, other government projects, group living and special needs housing that would stay affordable. We're trying to make it, if you're already doing the right thing, we don't want to overregulate. So, you know, if you're doing micro units, they're going to stay affordable without having any, any requirement on them. Um, uh, additional details, uh, we're proposing the affordability period be 30 years and that it reset on resale. Some advocates would like a uh, perpetuity. Um, if you re reset the 30-year period when you sell 10 or 15 years down the road, you end up getting kind of effective perpetuity with much of your supply. And there's no real reason why somebody's lived there for 15 or 20 years and they resell it to somebody, they get the same affordability rate that they should only have it for 10 years. It doesn't quite make common sense. Um, this premise is built on us uh, creating a system that is much easier for an average homeowner to resell a unit. If any of you watch, confess to watching TV and seeing like the rocket mortgage, you know, where people are getting a mortgage app on their phone. I can say that, you know, I got my, uh, when I bought the fee to my condo, I did it all on my iPad, you know, except for one, you know, million signing and closing. So we think that we can uh, much, you know, simplify and make a lot easier that resale system so it's not so burdensome. Um, it'll be enforced at building permit issues or in the subdivision approval process. Functionally, if you're getting a, like something like an IPD, permit or subdivision you'd do the agreement then but you'd have to 
record the, the covenant on the land before you actually get your building permit. So it's kind of two-tiered. Um, we're starting to work on updating the administrative rules um, and the 30-year affordability period. That'll be in both the agreement and a restrictive covenant, which will also automatically qualify you if you're imposing that to the fee and tax waivers that we'll get to in a little bit. Um, the 30-year minimum is the most critical element, and we've had um, lots of our friends and developers and folks in the real estate industry say that buyers need to be able to sell at market rate after 10 years to build capital and move up the housing ladder. This is a good argument. Everybody wants their kids to be able to buy a house. You sort of want to use that equity to send kids to college and things like that. So this is a good argument, but the public purpose of this requirement is to help grow and maintain that stable supply of affordable housing. We think we have one crafted that can do both, okay? That will give people that leg up, let them buy a market rate uh, unit for their next unit, free up the affordable unit, and give a really broad first step onto that housing ladder and, and maintain that first step over time. So in terms of moving up the housing ladder, how does it, how does it work in practice? Um, we think we can create and maintain the significant supply while providing a fair return to home buyers. If you assume a $300,000 unit with 10% down, an average 1% annual increase tied to CPI, we're just picking 1%, it would vary by CPI, that 30,000 down payment would increase 10% per year. You know, so 1% of 300,000 is 10% of the $30,000 down payment. That's a really good investment um, that could grow to over seventy seven thousand dollars in ten years um, the principal payments could add an addition depending on what your loan rate is and terms um, could grow to over seventy seven thousand dollars in ten years so uh, excuse me could grow forty thousand to sixty thousand in equity over ten years so uh, somebody buying an affordable home that's limited to one percent appreciation or whatever the CPI is in that given year could amass $117,000 to $137,000 down payment for a market rate home purchase in 10 years, and still keeping that home relatively affordable in the supply. Um, so that's our own calculations here. Um, good news is there's been some national research on this that actually mirrors exactly um, what, what we're saying here. A 2009 Urban Institute study, they studied seven um, uh, properties. I picked San Francisco, seven cities. I picked San Francisco because they have kind of equal, really high cost too. For the actual 10 year period ending in 2010, the typical affordable home seller made $70,000 on resale for an average return of 11.3% interest on the down payment. So this actually works in practice. I should mention that San Francisco requires way lower AMIs and way lower uh, discounts. So they're one of the reasons why that's seventy thousand dollars rather than a hundred or more is in San Francisco the affordable purchasers are, are getting it at a much much lower AMI okay um, so grounded solutions network uses the homekeeper app data that was developed by mr. Jacobus it's a, a Salesforce app that tracks all this kind of stuff um, they uh, get data on 80 programs across the nation and they're tracking how many affordable home sellers are able to then buy a market rate home uh, when they sell their affordable one. Nationally, it's 59%, essentially 60% of people nationally are able to buy a market rate home and move up the ladder. Uh, you've asked how do in-lieu fees work? So just, just quickly, that $45 per square foot would be applied to all floor area, not the commercial, just the residential in a building it would be paid before the building permit is issued. Um, for a hypothetical 100 unit building, say 800 square foot units, 100 times 800 times 45 is 3.6 million in in-lieu fees. So I've heard a lot of people in meetings saying, well, if you, you gotta divide that by $400,000 because that's what it costs to build a condo. <clears throat> but remember, we're only using that money to fill the gap, the affordability gap. So using the estimates from our, our Kaiser Marsden study of $70,000 gap for the 80 to 120 or 170 for stuff under 80, 
uh, 3.6 million divided by 70,000 could fund up to 51 units at the 120 and below, or divide by 170,000, it could fund 21 80% AMI units. Now this is just a study. The reality of, of development might be different. Um, strategic economics numbers in their pro forma had a range of 23,000 to 110,000 per affordable unit because they were covering more. But you can see the math is you can really produce e at least equal, if not more units using the in lieu fee if you're using that to just fill the gap on projects done by other developers. Um, Mr. Jacobus, um, we're, we're nearing the end. I know this is probably the longest bullet slide you've ever seen me present. Sorry for no images, but this is just the details. We're getting near the end. Uh, Mr. Jacobus met with a, a lot of us about how better to um, administer it and monitor it over time. Um, he recommended, uh, no news to um, those of you who deal with our budget, we are straining with capacity with the staff we have working on housing already so that as the supply builds over time, you know, not right away, but we'll need, you know, more staff capacity as the program goes. Um, he suggested exploring using the software tools, either the one he's developed or one that we could develop here, um, partner with state agencies because particularly if we're going to explore maybe contracting with a local nonprofit or land trust to conduct some of those administrative and monitoring roles. Um, it would be something that could be a contract that might could be shared with HF, um, HHFTC and HCDA. We met with them when Mr. Jacob was, was here to start talking about that stuff. And then consider whether we should have monitoring and resale fees so that that can help pay the cost of some of the extra monitoring. Um, this is just examples. We're not proposing the fees yet, but I wanted to put you um, on an alert that, you know, we need to consider these. Chicago charges $25 per unit per month for monitoring. Uh, New Jersey charges fees when they resell, um, whether it's with or without marketing. So that, that's just some of the ways to, to consider funding the staffing that will be needed over time as the program grows. Um, we have Mr. Jacobus under contract to come back and present all of this uh, analysis to, to meet with you. Uh, Chair Pine, when, when you're ready to kind of think about scheduling a you know, half-day workshop to really dig, we'll have him here for two or three days and he can also do individual meetings you know, with council members as well during that time. But he'll also be meeting with us to really start looking at the, um, what the roles ought to be and, and, and also meeting with the state agencies as well to better define how, how we can better monitor and administer it, make it, e if we're requiring all developers to do this, we need to make it much easier for them. If we're requiring 30 years of affordability, we have to make it much easier for that reseller 15 or 20 years down the road. And then just last, this is, uh, we may end up uh, developing, you know, our, our uh, information technology, you guys are pretty uh, Akamai, we could do that, or there are ones like Mr. Jacobus developed that's built on the Salesforce platform. It's free for nonprofits, you know, cities have to pay for it, but it actually helps organize, track data, you know, qualifications, and monitoring over time. One last uh, uh, concept I want to mention, uh, Chair Pine, you, you, you have, you know, advised that you're waiting to uh, act on the interim plan development permit revisions because it has the housing numbers in there. I just, uh, and you're waiting for us to, you know, introduce this. Um, we would encourage you to uh, move forward. I, I think we'll need multiple meetings uh, and workshops and hearings on the overall island-wide policy, but um, our recommendation from uh, Land Use Permits Division from Director is that we you do go ahead and move the interim one bill forward. It's exactly the same housing numbers in it, and as soon as you adopt the AHR, that will take the place of this. So we're confident that you could do you could do that. Um, but you know, it, it, it sets the minimum percentage of affordable housing, but it has some minor refinements in it that we really feel are needed to make it easier to, for developers. It clarifies some of the questions we've been having from them as they're trying to use the permit in terms of uses, landscaping, signage, open space, things like that. So those numbers are exactly the same as what you've seen. That slide is in there in the interim permit. So status and, and next steps. Um, 
housing requirement ordinance is in final review It'll be sent to council shortly um, same with the incentives ordinance I think we may be a week behind but that one has the incentives for waiving entirely the wastewater fees park dedication requirements um, real property tax over time for the rental units only and then building permit and inspection fees um, mayor is uh, meeting with the board of water supply board to ask the same of them and they're in in rate making right now that's a separate decision by that board but he's asking the, the same thing of the board of water supply um, we do have the bill 74 at council and waipahu zoning and i think you were you know wanting to wait until this was introduced to to move those forward you know we we think that